but why you're here today, Woodpeckers of Missouri. And before we really get going, I am going to um, just go over some logistical things. So uh, if you're unfamiliar with the Zoom platform, we cannot see you, um, we can only- I think Paige is freezing. Well, Paige was saying that, uh, yeah, we, we cannot uh, see you, uh, but we can hear from you in the chat. And we also have a Q and A feature, but Paige, are you back? It shows that I'm here. Can you not see or hear me? Oh, okay. So yeah, so if you have a question, we're gonna save questions until the end, but if you have it, you can put in that Q and A box. Um, and then we, and then, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Oh, and then if you, the chat function, if you have chat function, if you have any like um, issues, you can contact us, the panelists. And then um, the other one is the raise hand function. So if any of us at any time are like, does anybody know this woodpecker? You can like raise your hand and then we know you're, then you can participate in that way. Um, but let's get started. So woodpeckers of Missouri, cool group of birds. We're really excited to talk about them. Um, so we are the Missouri River Bird Observatory. So our mission is to contribute to the conservation of Missouri's birds through scientific research and monitoring, education, outreach, and advocacy. And so what that all means is we work to help birds. Um, so who's gonna be talking to you today are me. I am Paige Wittick, and I'm sorry if I seem to be going in and out. I guess my internet um, is not cooperating this evening, um, but I'm the education co coordinator for the organization. Um, Dana Ripper, the director, co-director and co-founder of the organization is also going to be telling you some stories this evening, as well as Ethan Duke and Zeb Yoko, who are going to be going over some of the different species we have here in Missouri. Um, so we've got quite a good presentation for you guys. Okay, there we go. Okay, so what we do, so we work towards providing quality habitats for birds. Feeding the flock refers to sustainable agriculture. We also work towards providing bird friendly communities and we work to get people out in nature enjoying those birds. And I'd say that last category is what we're really doing today. And if you wanna learn more about what each of those eggs means, you can visit our website, mrbo.org. So today, what are we gonna talk about? So first I'm gonna go over what is a woodpecker and why they're so awesome. Well, all of these are why they're so awesome and amazing, but specifically, you know, how and why they do what they do. <laughs> Then Dana is gonna, or we're all gonna kind of share some conservation stories that are gonna kind of intertwine with going over, over some of the different species that we have here in Missouri and we used to have here in Missouri. And then we're gonna have question and answer. So um, if you have any questions as we go, you can put those in the Q&A box, um, but we'll probably wait until the end to really answer those. So to start off, nature's headbangers, AKA woodpeckers. Now, these guys are so cool and important, and it's because of the main thing that they do, which is peck wood. And I'm gonna go over a little bit why and how they do that. Um, it's, and the headbanger thing is kind of, it's kind of fun to say, like if you ever were getting in a headbanging contest with a woodpecker, you wouldn't win. Um, someone told once, or I read somewhere or something, that the force that a woodpecker encounters when it bangs its head against a bark is like getting kicked in the head by a professional soccer player. Um, but obviously <laughs> woodpeckers have equipment and adaptations that allow them to do this much more safely than it would be for us to get kicked in the head by a professional soccer player. Um, so let's talk about that. So why do they do this? Why do they um, peck wood at an insane rate? Um, so to, I guess I forgot to say, but woodpeckers can peck 15 to 20 times a second, and that racks up to 8,000 to 12,000 taps a day, thousands of times a day they, they do this. And why do they do that? They do it for a couple different reasons. So one, you may have guessed, is to find food. And when woodpeckers, they can kind of like lightly tap on the bark of a wood, and they can even like essentially like hear from the vibrations if there's insects hiding underneath that piece of bark, which I think is super cool way to find food. Um, and we'll talk a little bit uh, more about that later too, because they have really special tongues that allow them to get these insects out too. 
Another reason that they do that, and this is probably the one that you're most familiar with, is to um, make nests inside the, um, and make cavities inside the trees to raise their young. Um, and we're gonna go into that a little bit more too as to why that's so important, not just for woodpeckers, but for a lot of other different creatures. And they also do it to drum messages to fellow woodpeckers. And those first two things, when they're hammering out um, holes in the trees and they're finding food, those types of taps are actually pretty quiet. Sometimes you can hear them excavating holes, um, but they're doing so in dead trees because um, the wood is softer and you don't typically hear it. When you hear a woodpecker drumming, you're hearing it, um, you're hearing this. Maybe you've heard that before. <laughs> Um, I forgot there was another one. Um, so that is the northern flicker drum and their drums are all a little bit different depending on the species, um, but they do this for a couple different reasons. So to find mates and to claim a territory. So woodpeckers don't have songs like some of the songbirds do where they sing to attract the female or they sing to um, claim a territory. Woodpeckers do this by the drumming that you hear. And sometimes you'll hear them doing it on your gutters or uh, your chimney or something like that. They're essentially picking something hollow that's gonna make a lot of noise to say, hey, this is my territory or hey, female, look at me. <laughs> and it's Looks like Paige froze again. Um, maybe it was her high level of energy. Um, but uh, where Paige is on her slide here, I guess I can uh, open up her presentation and take over. It looks Am like I she's back. Frozen? She's back again. <laughs> yeah. Must be just slight it's technical. It's saying that my internet connection is unstable, which is, so am I going in and out? Should I talk slower? <laughs> Yeah, maybe maybe not move quite so much, but I, I'm going to uh, open up your presentation in case you go out again, then I'll, I'll take over. Okay, um, so yeah, because I really want to talk about how they do it because it's really cool. <laughs> um, so woodpeckers, so the biggest thing, well, I don't want to say the biggest thing because all of these different things work together, um, but they have a specially shaped I'm frozen again, aren't I? <laughs> You're good. Okay. Um, it's I. It looks like you guys are frozen, so it, that seems to be like when I'm frozen. Um, but they have a specially shaped beak that's pointed at the end and web shaped, web wedge shaped. So if it were just pointy, it would kind of get stuck in the wood as it pecks into the wood. Um, but that wedge shape allows it to keep going. Um, and acts like a chisel, slowly scraping away the wood. They also have a special skull. So it's essentially a sponge that absorbs that impact of the woodpecker slamming its head against that piece of wood. And the brain is actually pretty tightly packed in their skull to eliminate that kind of bouncing around that your brain kind of does when you shake your head. They also have a long tongue, so you can kind of see in that last graphic, that goes all the way behind their head, like, um, like kind of like a tape measure that coils around. And that also helps protect their, their skull and their brain from when they slam against the wood. And they also have a tongue that's kind of barbed at the end, which you can kind of see here, and sticky so that when they stick their tongue into the wood, they can go in and grab an insect and slurp it out um, even far underneath the um, bark. Hmm. So that's pretty cool. Even their tongue is specialized. Um, they also, and this is something that you'll like, you know, when you see a woodpecker is they have, they use their tail like a kickstand. So their tail feathers are really strong and rigid and that allows it to act like a tripod as they hold against the tree. And they're also using very special feet. So it's called zygodactyl, which I think sounds like a dinosaur, which is awesome. Um, and it means two toes in front and two toes in back. 
And that allows them to really grip the tree like you see them gripping the tree being upright and horizontal. And those sharp nails that they have on their feet also help them grip that bark and stay like that. The last thing that I'll talk about that's really cool um, is that certain species like the downy, the hairy, and the pileated woodpecker have feathers that cover their nares or their nose holes, you can kind of think of them, kind of up on their beak. And so when they're chipping away at the wood, they kind of have, you can, it kind of works like a mask that those um, pieces don't fly up into their nose, which I think is really cool and something that I learned recently while researching for this webinar. Um, but I've always seen that and I always thought downies looked extra fuzzy right there. So there you go. It, there's a reason for it, of course. So that's how they're able to um, peck at that wood. And those tools are specialized for woodpeckers. And I like to say that a woodpecker hole is kind of like the original nest box, which I think some people have trouble making that connection between nest boxes and woodpeckers. So when we create a nest box, we're recreating what the woodpeckers already do because even when a woodpecker is done using its cavity, a lot of other birds use that cavity and they can't make, a lot of those other birds or creatures can't make the cavity themselves because they don't have all this specialized equipment like the beak and the tail and the feet and the skull and the tongue that the woodpeckers have to be able to do that. And so all kinds of other different species use these woodpeckers, including the tufted titmouse, black cap chickadees, Carolina chickadees, Carolina wrens, house wrens, eastern bluebirds, tree swallows, wood ducks, American kestrels, eastern screech owls, barn owls, prothonotary warblers, squirrels, and bats. So a lot of different things. And this isn't even a complete list. These are just some ones um, that come to mind for me originally as other species that use a woodpecker cavity to help raise their babies or take shelter. So that's all I'm going to share. So now we're going to, I'm going to turn it over to our resident woodpecker expert, Dana, <laughs> who's going to talk to you guys about some other cool stories related to some woodpeckers that used to be here in Missouri. <laughs> Okay. Good evening, everybody. Am I audible? All right. Okay. So I'm just going to go over a couple of these and then I'm going to hand it over to Zeb and Eth. Um, if there are folks that um, have been on our webinars before, you'll note that there's a small pattern that leans towards me doing some of the sadder things that we talk about. Um, so I thought that I should go next because we'll end on a happier note um, with the species that are still here in Missouri. But first about the couple that aren't, um, this is the red cockaded woodpecker and some folks on here that um, might be traveling birders have probably seen this bird. Um, it still exists in the southeastern United States. You can see the um, little red tuft of feathers there um, on the bird on the lower right. Um, and that is, it looked to um, early explorers that were naming species across the Americas, it looked like a cockade, um, as in a hat from that time period. So here are the historic and current ranges um, of the red cockaded woodpecker. So I'm going to ask you, this is a nice nature serve map. They have great maps. Um, you can actually make your own, but I'm going to ask you to ignore everything on the map legend other than where the bird is or was a permanent resident, which is in purple, um, because this is not a migratory species at all. Um, and you can see the red lines where um, the species has been extirpated. So you can see that it has been extirpated from Missouri. Um, and other places in its range, although it still exists in the purple area that does not have red lines on it. So what is extirpation, first of all, um, as opposed to extinction? So we call a species extirpated if it has been, if its populations have been driven completely to zero in a particular place. The species is not extinct, it exists elsewhere. Um, 
but it is not, it is no longer exists um, in whatever place is being spoken of. So in this case, Missouri. So in the case of the red cockaded woodpecker, they're very unique among woodpeckers because they drill their cavities into trees that are live um, with very little to sometimes even no heart rot. Um, Paige explained a little bit about different adaptations that woodpeckers have that allow them to excavate cavities in wood. In most cases, um, they need like a fairly hot, hot-rotted um, limb or trunk of a tree to be able to do that. But the red cockaded woodpecker um, will do so in live trees and you can see um, pine trees are their preferred habitat and you can see the sap running down. So this is actually a, a predator protection for their nests. However, they need fairly large trees and because they're live, it takes a lot more work to excavate the cavities. Um, therefore, it takes them a lot longer. So it can take months up to, um, I was recently reading that actually they can work on cavities for a couple of years. So you can imagine if um, you come in and, and log their habitat, they have nowhere to nest or roost after that. They can't just build a, a cavity really quickly like our other woodpecker species can. So that's basically what happens um, here in Missouri and in other places throughout the red cockaded woodpecker's range um, is the, the large scale clear cut logging that occurred in um, starting in roughly the 1820s and going into the middle of the 20th century. Um, so this is from the Shiloh Museum, which is Arkansas. Actually, um, we share a lot of our Ozark Forest natural habitat characteristics with Arkansas, with Northern Arkansas. And this is a, a note in a local paper at the time. Um, they say that while we removed our vast forest, but we have many thousands of acres of valuable farmlands, um, for folks that are on the all that are from Missouri or have spent time in the Ozarks, you'll know that there isn't a ton of farming going on in the Ozarks either, actually. Um, the farmland was eventually considered to be quite poor because it's very rocky and there's not a lot of topsoil. Um, so at this point, we do have quite a lot of our acreage of Ozark forest back, um, and it's being certainly a lot better managed than it was um, in the red cockaded's time. So red cockaded woodpeckers were last seen in Missouri in the mid 1940s. So this is kind of what their habitat looks like. Very, very open understory um, that is maintained by fire. Um, obviously pre-settlement that would have been um, either prescribed fire or possibly um, indigenous people setting fires in some cases. Um, but you have a very, very, very open um, canopy and very open understory. And this picture was actually taken at a site in Arkansas where I once did some monitoring of a very small remnant population of red cockaded woodpeckers. Um, I am not really a woodpecker expert, as Paige said. Um, I've worked with a lot of people that are, are far more experienced in working with woodpeckers than I am, but I did kind of work on these two species that I'm talking about. Um, so that was, that was one place. Um, so this is an incredibly intensively managed species. The red cockaded woodpecker was one of the first species to be listed under the Endangered Species Act in the early 70s. Um, and even today, one of the things, because of the scarcity of nesting cavities and the length of time it takes the species to excavate them, um, one of the things that people have done in order to essentially get, build them homes more quickly um, is to install these artificial nest cavities. And so essentially you climb up a, what's known as a Swedish ladder, uh, it's a logging tool. You can see the gentleman on the right there um, has done that and chainsaw out a hole in a tree and then insert um, a nesting cavity. And so this has been really very successful in managing populations. Um, and you'll note that if you do a Google search for red cockaded woodpecker, you will very rarely see pictures of birds that do not have bands, leg bands, um, on their legs. And that is because all of the remaining colonies um, of red cockaded woodpeckers are very intensively managed and tracked and monitored. Um, and then another bird that is really quite famous that has not only been extirpated from the state of Missouri, but is extinct, um, is the ivory-billed woodpecker. So this is a bird that many of you may know. Uh, it made a lot of headlines 
15 or so years ago because it had been thought to have been extinct for a very long time. Um, and then there was an announcement that it was found in Arkansas. Um, and I'll talk about that just a little bit later. So here's the historic range map of the ivory billed woodpecker. You can see it came up a little bit into Missouri, um, into our boot heel. These are a couple pictures of the sort of habitat that this bird did inhabit. You've got a cypress swamp there on the bottom. You have a kind of a second flooded bottoms, a little bit up from swamp, so it's not flooded all the time, um, but a, a tupelo, sweet gum, green ash, sort of bottom land hardwood forest habitat. And this was the haunt of this particular bird. So a great deal of what we know about this species came from a series of expeditions in the mid 1930s out of Cornell. Um, and by this point, the ivory billed woodpecker was already very scarce. It was probably not a super common numerous species to begin with. The, um, the species really required a large home range um, and it was, it, being a very large bird, it ate very large food. So um, very large mature grubs and, and other such insects that were themselves not incredibly common. Um, so by 1935, this bird was already very, very scarce. And one of the last remaining known populations was in a place called the Singer Tract in Louisiana. And that is where most of our, I, if not all of our photos and videos of the species come from is this expedition out of Cornell. So I thought this was super interesting. Um, and I just found this myself recently. You can see um, the original range of the bird is in the sort of darker green color. And then the lighter olive color is um, the range by 1885. So fairly early, this bird was already being pushed into a smaller range and was disappearing. And then by 1900, you can see a, um, a little bit in Texas, a little bit in Louisiana, um, down in southeastern Arkansas, and then Florida. Um, and so this, I thought was a nice representation of the sightings since 1944. Uh, 1944 was the last record that is considered absolutely verified um, and, and without doubt. And so you can see that there have been a lot of possible sightings since that time um, that are considered, and some of them are, are considered more credible than others, but they're all not 100% verified. <clears throat> so I thought that this photo, which, which came from that Singer tract in Louisiana, um, is, is very indicative of how a lot of ornithologists, a lot of birders, um, and just a lot of folks that, uh, that even dabble in bird watching feel about this particular species. This is basically like a ghost. Um, people really want it to exist. Um, and so much so that you can see all those sightings on the previous map. Um, in 2004, 2005, um, I was part of Cornell's uh, search team that lived in Arkansas for, for five months over the winter of 0405 and following a quite credible sighting of an ivory billed woodpecker, we spent five months in the swamps going around looking for the bird. Um, and it was a wonderful experience, but we did not find any conclusive evidence at that time. So to me, it remains a ghost. Enough sad stuff, everybody. Next, I believe, is Ethan. I think he's getting set up here. Yep, there he is. There we are, everybody. Um, Zeb and I actually had a debate. We had an internal marble fight over what woodpeckers we would do and describe. Um, but we, I think we ended up happy because they're all just really awesome, including this beautiful gem. Wonderful Missouri photo here by Julie Patton. Um, you can see it's a lovely crest and it's other characteristics that we'll describe later, but 
Um, just just an example of how, how amazing they are. I'm happy you're getting to know them. And I will make one, one other point about this in that in 1936, a guy named Jim Oots found this Native American tablet near Van Meter in the fields of Van Meter State Park, which is here in Saline County. And now, is that not a woodpecker with a really cool tongue? I mean, that's, that's definitely Na Native American art representing what it seems like a woodpecker. And this has been seen in other cultures uh, whose land we now occupy. And I think it's just kind of neat to, to um, see that they've always been a part of our world to enjoy. And I'm glad that we can, we can continue to embrace them. Um, another great photo by Marvin DeJong. Um, and uh, what? You cannot see my screen? Oh, uh, okay. Um, so there, now you can see my face. Thank you, Dana. Um, yeah, so, but the woodpeckers are so cool. Um, so the pileated woodpecker right here is our biggest one. I said, start big, we'll start big and work our way around. Um, th this woodpecker, you may have, may have not seen, they are somewhat shy. If you encounter them in the bottomland forest, Dana was just talking about the, 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 ivory build and this is our most closely related woodpecker that's remaining and um, I actually about 11 years ago worked on a project in Arkansas which was the last dregs of the ivory build project where we were putting telemetry on pileated trying to determine what their what their dispersal of the young would be to see how much habitat the ivory builds would potentially need if we we're going to procure enough habitat to sustain them um, but now we know that story um but here they are big loud noisy birds um they do offer um some really interesting characteristics that help us know a little bit more about them in particular if you just get a front view the amount of red that goes down to that base of the bill there which is called the nasal canthus if the amount of red goes all the way down there it's a male if it's not then it's a female also um that red malar stripe, that red mustache, really gives away the fact that this is a male if you see them from the side. Um, they are also quite vocal. I often think of them as laughing at us as they fly over because they seldom give us really good looks in certain areas. Some people have them coming to their feeders. But um, I was fortunate to capture this, this vision that you see here at the nest. I was able to capture that through audio recording about 10 years ago uh, in New York State. And so you'll be able to hear the adult and then you'll be able to hear the babies and then the interaction with the adults and the babies. So it's something to listen out for, but it's also just pure kind of interesting to listen to. They look like little muppets. In this nest, there are three of them climbing up on top of each other, and the two big ones let the little one come up and get some food from the parents. So that's that's our uh, our biggest one. So why not just jump down to the smallest one right off the bat? Uh, downy woodpecker. Uh, uh, how many of you have uh, seen that downy woodpecker before? Um, it's one of our most common, it's at our feeders a lot. It's small size, gives them a big advantage because they can perch on some of the smaller things out there and still forage away. Um, key ID features with this guy, it has a red spot on the back of its head if it's a male um, and the female does not have it. So that's a good ID feature for this species and the next species we'll discuss. Um, and, uh, that the next species that we're going to compare it to, the hairy woodpecker, the big uh, ID feature that you need to recognize because you'll seldom see them together is their, their size. The uh, downy's a little bit smaller, but it's the, 
ratio of bill size as the bill, the ratio of the tip of the beak to the nasal canthus, and then from the nasal canthus to the back of the eye is roughly equidistant on the downy woodpecker. Now, on a hairy woodpecker, which is a little bit bigger, that distance is much smaller. It's got a much bigger beak in proportion to the size of its head. But notice it still has that same characteristics that Downy, do, Downy does with its, the males have that red spot. And the young have a little red spot on their forehead when they first fled sometimes too. That's pretty cute. So there's one other characteristics that a lot of people don't see right away because of the way they perch. But this is also a helpful ID feature. And that on their undertail coverts, the downy woodpeckers have little spots, whereas the hairies do not. And those are helpful things. And the other thing, of course, is their voice when they're calling. A downy woodpecker's goes down, dee 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 dee. And a hairy woodpecker's is stays constant. Da -da 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 so let's listen to the downy. Hear that taper off at the end? Dee -dee 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 -dee. And then the hairy. So there you are. Those are the downies and harries. Those will be the most difficult ones you have to distinguish between all of our seven Missouri woodpeckers. Okay, let's go back to this beauty here. The northern flicker. Malar stripe. Guys have mustaches for some reason, but it's, it's a malar stripe. Um, and that is how you determine that's particularly a male one. But um, I can just marvel at this bird all day for it, its beauty. Um, another good ID feature, uh, that's a H Hubert Woods Jr. photo, really great photo, um, feeding a chick. Um, a great ID feature from these particular birds is that white rump patch. And you might think, how am I gonna see a white rump patch on these woodpeckers when they're flying around up in the trees? Well, this particular woodpecker offers you that great ID feature and it's often on the ground. It's very unwoodpecker like in that way. And it's actually somewhat migratory. It really moves in sometimes large groups, so you'll see many together. And when you see one take off from the forest floor or from a levee someplace, you'll see that, that white rump patch. It's very diagnostic. In Missouri, we have the yellow shafted, sometimes the red shafted, and sometimes an intergrade. So they really look like these yellow shafts, instead of being yellow, they'll be quite orange. And so uh, this is two different, it just shows that beautiful regional variation that we have within that family. Uh, I'll move to the sound. Clear, clear. It's a very common sound you'll hear out there. You'll hear that sometimes more than you see them, but a very diagnostic thing, only that Northern Flicker has that. Um, that wraps up our, our woodpeckers. I don't know why I have that slide in there because Zeb has a few more to talk to that are on this picture that aren't, I'll let Zeb take over now. All right, thanks, Ethan. I will have the rest of them. Let's get my screen sharing. Okay. Can you guys see what I've got going here? Okay, so we good? Yeah, okay, I got a thumbs up. Excellent. So I'm gonna start off with the red-bellied woodpecker. Um, that's the first one I'm gonna talk about. They are very common in Missouri and regularly visit the right types of feeders. So they'll, some people will see them in their backyards. Um, they're not as big as the pileateds, which Ethan first talked about, but they are chunkier than the downy or the hairy woodpeckers. And actually they're about the same size as the flickers. Um, and now for the identifying colors for the red-bellied, um, actually the most, um, the things that you see the easiest are the black and white striped back and then red on the head, even though it's a red-bellied woodpecker. And actually this red on the head varies in, in the it's varying degrees of red um, based on the sex. And I'll show that in the next picture, we'll cover that. Um, so yeah, they have black and white stripes and then red on the head and then maybe a little bit of red on the belly. 
this picture you can't really see it from. And then let's see on the, another photo um, by Tom Tucker here. You can maybe see a slight reddish tinge, but I will point out that you can see much better on here the difference in the, the varying red on the head. So the males, which I have with the blue arrow here, have a full stripe of red. Um, and then the females have red basically on the cap, and then they have a gray patch here. Um, a gray or a buff or a tan color, some sort of color that's not quite as stark red that the male has here. Um, and then again, you can see that there's kind of like a faint orangish pink on the belly. Um, but it's still not a very uh, easy ID trait, even though that's what their name is from. Uh, especially when you see birds like this where they're clinging to a tree belly, their belly side is always on the tree. So I'll get into it a little bit later, um, why the name might be that way. Um, and it'll kind of show on my other couple, when I go through other couple species, you'll get a better idea of why the name is, um, seems a little odd, but kind of makes sense, but still could, it's, it's still a little weird. <laughs> they're the ones that make the least sense for the name. Um, so since you can't really use the colors to ID it between the other woodpeckers, because so far what, all the woodpeckers we've seen have some sort of black, white, and red on them, um, the call is going to be your better um, option for identification. And here we should hear that call uh, right here. Is that coming through? Okay. I got a thumbs up from, from Ethan. Cool. So they have this really, um, I call it a squawk. Um, and they're the only ones that have that, if there's like a little roll or a warble in it as that squawk goes through. And I would say that's the one thing that's really unique about the red-bellied woodpecker for their identification by the sound. Um, one thing I'll, I'll hammer in with the next bird is that woodpeckers also, at least to me, have a, um, they're a good example of birds whose vocalization are true to size, where the pileated woodpecker has a, the loudest and deepest call, and then these red bellies are somewhere in the middle, and then less so with the hairy and the downy woodpecker. You may have picked up on that with the, the downy and the hairy woodpecker's um, calls. The downy even sounds like it's a little bit smaller than the hairy, and I think all the woodpeckers kind of demonstrate that. Which leads me to my next bird here. Um, which did not go through yet. Here we go. Okay. It's my personal favorite of the woodpeckers we're presenting today. Um, Ethan was was right. We did, we did have uh, a little bit of a discussion of who gets to go over which which woodpeckers. Um, this was my personal favorite, so I was really happy that I got to present on this one. He got the flicker, which is another one of my favorites. So it all works out, though. They're all really cool, like we, like everyone said so far. Um, but yeah, this is the redheaded woodpecker, um, and it's my favorite probably because it's really common in the town that I live in, which is really odd. They're not, they're generally uncommon or on the decline in, in general, but where I live, they're just kind of a yard bird, which, and, or on the porch, you'll see them climbing up telephone poles outside, which is really cool. And also they have some really cool adaptations and they're a really, um, they're a striking bird and I'll get into that here in a second. So the redhead woodpecker is smaller than the last two, but bigger than the downy and hairy. So it's, it's kind of again in the middle somewhere. And its coloration more is in chunks and patches not barring and stripes, so you've got a big patch of black and then a patch of white and then a white belly here and then a bright red head. Um, and then true to its name, it strictly is red on the head. You don't have to worry about striping or differences by the different sexes. It's all, their, their head is red, <laughs> which makes it really easy to say it's a red-headed woodpecker, um, which is really good for IDing because you don't have to worry about the different stripes and streaks. So if it's stripey or streaky, it's probably not the red-headed woodpecker, but it have, has a clear red head, that's what you got. Um, they also have a unique call note. Um, one second, I got I had a pop up here. All right, so they have a unique call note. Um, they do convey, again, that true to their size. It's not quite as big as the red belly, but it's close. Um, and I'm going to play it back right here. So hopefully that did that go. I hopefully that went through. Um, I, for some reason, I can't hear them when I play now, but they're playing for you guys. Um, so I call it, it's a shrieky call note, kind of. Um, it's very distinct, kind of like a shriek-like sound. And then you also should have heard a cackle back and forth between multiple individuals. That cackle is really kind of that's not very um, 
doesn't necessarily narrow it down because that sounds a lot like starlings and other blackbirds. Um, but these, these red-headed woodpeckers have that note that they call back and forth. So if you see a couple of those, or you hear that in the treetops and you see things with red heads on them, you can guess that's probably what they are. And then for good measure, there was drumming at the end too, because it's a woodpecker, you gotta hear what the drumming sounds like. Um, yeah. So the other thing that I, I, I mentioned it before is that they're really striking when you see them. And that's because there's lots of white on these birds. Like they're really the only bird of that size and shape that have that much white on them. If you see them flying, they almost look entirely white, especially from the back. And that's because those chunks of black and white, well, the chunks of white are these, these primary flight feathers here, and they are, it's white on both sides of the bird. So you've got the white belly and body, and then you've got this white um, patch on the bird. And then it's just separated by these black tips, which actually get separated when it's flying in the air. So you really see kind of this white back and then the red head and then the black tail. Um, the only other bird that you could really confuse it with that has that sort of color pattern is like a domesticated pigeon or some sort of feral pigeon. Um, I mean, it may only be true in the town that I live in because we have both pigeons and red-headed woodpeckers here. Um, but yeah, so that's the, that's the key to, to my favorite one. And then I'll go to what was um, some other members of our staff. It was their favorite one that they were bummed that I was able to scoop. So this one is the yellow-bellied sapsucker. And again, it has a lot of black and white and then red on the head. And then I guess the, the belly is kind of this off-white creamish color, which does give you a good idea of maybe that's where this name came from. So again, the woodpeckers are very, they all have this similar patterning of black, white, and red. So any little difference from it, they do try and they incorporate it into the names. And then the sapsucker part, I'll get into it just a second too. Um, and that's from its unique drilling behavior, which I will talk about here. Yes, so, um, Yellow-bellied sapsuckers, they drill these unique wells um, of saps, and they're almost always in straight lines like this. You usually straighten a grid across and then straight up and down like this. They're, they're shallower than, say, a cavity for nesting. Um, and another thing with the yellow-bellied sapsuckers is they have these wells, of course, that you can see here, and they're very iconic. You can see those on anything that they drill. You have anything that looks like that, you have a pretty good idea that it's going to be from a yellow-bellied sapsucker. But yellow-bellied sapsuckers also are migrants. They're one of the few woodpeckers that do have particular migratory patterns, at least in our area. So they'll be here um, in the fall and winter and over winter, but they'll head up north in the spring to do their breeding season. So you'll see them all winter round, and then you won't see them, but you'll still might see their evidence. Um, okay, so they have a couple different calls, and here I'm going to play, play first their call. It sounds a little bit unwoodpecker-like to me but it is also a unique note that you can use to identify the bird. Um, and then there's also a good example of their odd slow drumming. So they have a unique drumming pattern too, and it's really slow compared to the other like da 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 of the other guys. Okay, so that should be done. Hopefully you guys were able to hear those. Um, they're, they're another cool ID traits, again, with these things, especially if they're going to be up in the tops of trees uh, or just anywhere in the forest, it can be harder to, to land the ID of a bird by looking at it. So you got to know what to listen to as well. Okay, so these woodpeckers are, I, I, I said that they're neighborly birds. Uh, their well drilling is uh, distinct for the sapsucker, but it's also occupied by other birds. Other birds will take advantage of these holes where there's just sap flowing out of trees. Um, here we have an opportunistic yellow rump warbler using a pre-drilled well and taking either sap out of it. Or one other thing that happens is because you have this sugary sap just sitting on the side of a tree, bugs will be attracted to it and sometimes they get stuck into it. So birds might also eat the bugs that are attracted to these wells. Um, so uh, yellow rump warblers are one example for sure. Sometimes people have even, people have claimed that they've seen hummingbirds. So that's another cool one. I'm sure there are many other birds I can't think of off the top of my head, but many other birds use these neighborly um, pre-drilled buffets, basically, that the sapsuckers do for them. 
Okay, and then the last thing I'm gonna cover is why are these names unclear? So a lot of the common names, birds are unique because we have common names that are unique to a species that we use. Most people don't even know those scientific names. I mean, heck, I don't know most of the scientific names. I have to look it up when I'm looking at a recording or something in particular. But I feel like I know most of my birds just, just by the common name. So the um, common names originate from the American Ornithological, Ornithological Union, or AOU. Um, they created their first checklist back in 1886. So one thing you might think of is the technology of the time gave them a different perspective on what the birds actually look like. Many of the birds were first described by John James Audubon, whose illustration we see here. Um, this is actually the yellow-bellied, it says yellow-bellied woodpecker, but it's the yellow-bellied sapsucker now. So the names have changed a little bit, but they get their origins this way. And when I say that technology of the times in quotes, I mean, they didn't necessarily have very good optics. So, and they didn't have photographs. So the way you would get images of birds was by painting them. Well, birds are notorious for not standing still. So birds were often taken, uh, he used shotguns to kill the bird and then you could put it in a pose and get a really good close up of it. So you've got these really good close ups. You can see like, oh, that is yellowish, doesn't capture on photos very well and you can't see it when you're IDing in the field, but it is something that you can see when you have a bird in the hand. So that's kind of where some of these obscure names come up because it's really hard to see, oh, I got ahead of myself. It might be really hard to see in the field, but when you're holding it in your hand, it's a really clear identification trait. And I didn't put a slide in of the red-bellied woodpecker, but the same thing holds for that. It's got this really pinkish um, belly that shows when you're holding it, but not necessarily when you're trying to ID it. And I did want to acknowledge also, my recordings that I use came from Xenocanto, which is a open source um, links sharing um, location for bird songs and calls. And then most of my photos, there were a couple from Audubon Society, but most of my photos came from photo contest participants in the past. We have many great contributors that have these fantastic photo abilities that we've been using, we've been using with permission their, their photos for all of our presentations. And then I know Paige mentioned she had to do a little bit of research before. I also had to do some research for mine to make sure I knew exactly what I was talking about for this presentation. And one of the first things I'll look at is Cornell's All About Birds. And then I did want to put a shout out to the Audubon Society because they have those prints available for download, like these wonderful pictures here, which is a collection of woodpeckers. Not all of them are from this area, but some of the ones we talked about today are specifically featured. And then I will end with our question slide and we will get back to our panel. I'll leave that up for a little bit. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for going over those resources. Because yeah, if any of you are wanting to learn more about woodpeckers or any species you can think of, um, those are some really good places to start, um, of birds at least. <laughs> um, yeah, so before we go on to questions, I just want to quick uh, summarize by just saying that I think woodpeckers are amazing and important creatures. <laughs> And that if you're interested in learning more, um, you can visit those resources I've talked about. But also, um, if you have a kid at home or a grandchild, or if you if you want to, we have a bunch of copies of the Explorer magazine that the Missouri Department of Conservation puts out. And we have the one specifically talking about woodpeckers. And it goes through the different species of woodpeckers in Missouri and some of the different adaptations that I talked about. So if you're interested in that, I'm going to put my email in the chat box and you can go ahead and email me your mailing address and I'll go and send you one. Um, so if you're interested in that, let me know. <laughs> um, I, before we get to the questions, I wanted to point out, I think Ethan, Ethan kind of mentioned that he made this slide um, at the end of his presentation. But yeah, this is Ethan's slide. Um, one thing he did is he did a really good job of trying to scale the actual pictures of the birds. So you see relative size of all the different woodpecker species um, on, this, on this image here. And then I think I will close this so I can see you guys and we can see the whole panel as we're answering questions. But yeah, I just wanted to compliment Ethan and his wonderful video and photo editing abilities here. And then we will go ahead and answer questions. All right. Okay, so we got a couple questions in the Q&A box and folks um, keep them coming if you want. Our first question is from Lara. 
Um, I have heard that woodpeckers have bills that continue growing throughout their lives since they constantly drum against trees. Is this true? Um, and from what we understand, yes, that is true. Um, the beaks have an interior of bone, of course, um, and then they have keratin and collagen proteins around them. So in a way, kind of similar to our nails, probably. Um, harder, definitely, and will take you know, more impact than, than certainly our fingernails or toenails would. Um, but functioning largely the same. And I think that's a really good question because obviously we don't see a bunch of older woodpeckers around um, and they can live, you know, eight years, even 10 years. Um, if we know this from banding data um, from the bird banding lab. We don't see a bunch of woodpeckers flying around with little nubs of beaks, right? Little rounded off nubs of beaks. Um, so yeah, that was a good question. Thank you. And next we have um, a question from Marsha. Does the yellow-bellied sapsucker use a live tree? Also, what kind of tree? And Ethan's gesturing near me that he would like to answer. Yeah, sure, because I was really curious about that as well. And so I was like looking, being like, is there certain trees that would be great to have for them? Or are certain trees, you know? So I looked into it at uh, the Birds of the World at Cornell site, and they have every feature of birds you'd ever possibly imagine. And I looked up and they said, you, microhabitat for foraging, they say, usually in trees, sap wells recorded in about a thousand species of perennial woody plants. So they, they don't discriminate. <laughs> they find quite a few different trees to, to drill into. It's, a, it's an interesting question and fun Dang. to look into. I had no idea it was that many. <laughs> I didn't either. Sort of anec anecdotal note here. Um, I remember when I worked in Mississippi um, in bottomland forests down there, there were many, many wintering sapsuckers, more than, than I see here in Missouri, certainly. Um, you could hear their little calls that Zeb played that I think sound like a little kind of like cry. Um, but I saw them actually even foraging on woody vines quite a lot. Um, even with relatively small diameter. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Well, we have a few people that we know of that have regular sapsucker visitors to their suet too. And was, we've kept suet out for a decade and we don't get yellow bellied sapsuckers. Somebody got in the, in the same town, gets them every year, every day. I mean, it's just, a matter of luck, I guess. And then we'd never see them around our place. And then one time we were doing banding many years ago and we caught one. I'm like, why didn't you avail yourself? But no, they're, they're, they might be there. You just have to really, if you see their well holes, you don't know they're there probably every winter. They're just being sneaky. It sounds like with that much diversity of host plants that they must have some personal taste too. I mean, and they're just probably personally specific more than maybe more than anything but I don't really know. I, I see will them say on... the, the pictures I was using, I think um, they're from further north. What, they're more common in their breeding range, I guess, it's, or maybe it's easier to find them. I, I don't know, but those are uh, birch and pine trees, I think, because they were, the, I found those photos, actually, we didn't have a super bunch of those on our photo contest. So those ones I, I took off of Flickr and I did gave credit because they're all creative commons or share and share alike stuff, but they were from further north too. Excellent. For those of you that live near or around Arrow Rock, which is where I am at, um, I have a pretty reliable spot for yellow-bellied sapsuckers every winter, which is near the Big Spring, um, kind of at the corner of the road to the Big Spring that is parallel to the Big Spring, and the road that goes up to the campground up that hill. If you go to that corner, and you go to that tree next to the big spring, there are sap sucker, sap sucker wells on it. And almost every winter I go there, I do see a, or hear the yellow bellied sap sucker. So if you're looking for a place to go find it, that's maybe a place to start if you're near. But it looks like we have another question too, which is awesome. Um, so, and I don't know the answer to it. I'm not sure if we do, but do we know why that's... woodpeckers are mostly patterned in red, black, and white? <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm typing an answer into that one right now. Um, 
but um, uh, it's such a great question because I mean I look at Dana and Zeb and Seth and like we 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 ask the same questions oftentimes because that's like the biological way to think to ask that type of question. Um, why why do they have why are they so similar and oftentimes why are they so similar even if they're not that closely related? And what we've we've come to find out is this concept called convergent evolution. So you might have mammals that swim or you might have gilled things like fish and you might have dolphins and they operate the same way and they may have similar fins and similar patterns, but those are all because the forces of natural selection affected them the same way. So whether it was the great amount of color um, to be good camouflage in the typical situations that they're in, or they're selected by, the, by their mates to have those types of characteristics, it just happened to have the same forces on them the same way. So that's, I don't know how I'm going to type that answer, but that's convergent evolution. That's it. <laughs> that would have been a long one. Um, also to note, that is almost the, the black and white and then red, some red patterning is true of almost every species in North America that I can be an exception and you all correct me if I'm wrong, um, would be Lewis's woodpecker out west, which is like a slaty gray and, and, and pink, actually, a, a dusky pink color. Um, but I will note that on, um, in other areas of the world, woodpeckers are not all black and white and red. Um, so I think it's partially, you know, Ethan mentioned camouflage with that sort of zebra stripey back. Um, that's often a, a really good camouflage pattern. Um, some species, again, I guess I'm just expanding on what Ethan said, um, sexual selection. So the really flashy colors, you know, particularly I think of redheaded woodpecker. That is, they're not real camouflage. They're definitely meant um, to attract attention, right? Um, and so, so it's interesting though that with the exception of one species, our North American woodpeckers are, uh, and, excuse me, flickers as well. Including, I was going to say flicker. Including, yeah. yeah, flicker, flicker as well, and I mean not just the yellow shafted, but. Um, others as well. But um, in other regions of the world, there's woodpeckers that are that are green and that are, you know, pink. And um, I can't think of a blue one that I've ever heard of. But otherwise, they're, they're all colors. So that is more of a convergent evolution thing here on this continent. And if you want to dive a little bit deeper into it, the relationship between behaviors in that the convergent evolution, you think about Lewis's and woodpeckers and northern flickers, how are they different than our other North American woodpeckers? Well, their behaviors are quite a bit different. I mean, I, first time my life, my life view of a Lewis's woodpecker, I'm like, it's acting like a flycatcher and it's up on the top of this pine tree. That's so weird. That's a woodpecker. And then northern flickers, they're on the ground so much. It's really unique. So maybe that has some sort of linkage. I think that's why I, for, I forget about Northern Flicker when we're talking about woodpeckers is because they act so dissimilarly to the other woodpeckers. Um, we have another question unless y'all okay with that. Um, Chris asks, I know to leave dead trees for woodpeckers, but are dead branches on a live tree good for them? Ethan's given a big thumbs up. I give it a thumbs up also. Absolutely. So you're the dead trees are going to have abundant insect life that they'll want to peck at. And for particularly our downy woodpecker, the smallest one, they've definitely, I mean, obviously they can't make a cavity in something that's the size of my finger, but if it's a limb of any kind of decent size, they will, they will make a, a nest cavity in it as well. And uh, the foraging on those things, uh, it just makes me think of that great book, The Life of a Log. And so we, in wildlife management, we classify um, dead trees as different classes from newly dead to like really, really falling apart. And then the same thing for trees that have fallen over on the ground and logs and things that have fallen off the tree that are on the ground. There's several different classes of that. And you can imagine all the different types of critters that want those different stages of decay. 
and the woodpeckers take advantage of every single one of them. <laughs> Oh, we got a Q&A. Are there any federal or state laws protecting dead trees that are safe to retain since they are such valuable habitat for many animals? Well, yes. You can't, you can't legislate morality. But um, the, the driver that has been uh, successful for getting more preservation of dead trees is a pretty well-known study that came out of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology at the Arnott Forest in the late 70s. And they actually quantified a financial value, a metric and dollar amount per acre that your the value of your timber was improved by leaving those snags. And they as hypothesized because it provided substrate to woodpeckers to help keep the pest damage down. And there are protections in certain areas, um, particularly in areas of habitat that are important to the uh, other species in the Endangered Species Act. Um, I know uh, a lot of wetland construction, they have to work around some snags if it's during the Indian and bat nesting period. And of course, if there's, a, if there's a bald eagle nest in a tree and that tree's dead, it's protected too. They don't take down bald eagle nests. But particularly for woodpecker conservation, not that I'm aware of. I think there are a lot of voluntary programs. Um, I'm actually more familiar with the ones in Washington state. Um, I worked on hairy woodpeckers up there and there's a lot of obviously commercial forestry that goes on and there are incentive programs now again, there aren't, they aren't federal or state laws, but they are federal and state incentive programs for um, forest products companies to leave a certain amount of, of dead and dying trees and even um, create them. So I was, a, I was a very small part of a project where they were actually inoculating trees, live, totally healthy Douglas fir and Western hemlock with, with um, a species of fungus called the red-belted conch. And so the purpose of that was to essentially simulate an older growth forest so that particularly woodpeckers would move in, make their cavities um, for, for the other critters that would, would use them after woodpeckers. So um, I think, yeah, there's a lot of incentives. I'm still reeling a little bit, thinking about a, a ton, a, a, a bald eagle nest that weighs a ton and a dead tree is kind of freaking me out, Zeb. But <laughs> <laughs> you can't take them down until nature does. Um. I was going to ask related to that, are there any, I, back in the day when I was doing wetland surveys, I know we were supposed to point out prothonotary warblers or prothonotary, like I want to get into that too, I want to put a pin in that, but are there state level protections for, for trees on, in the water for prothonotary warblers in Missouri? Or is it just there's nest boxes and conservation efforts going into it? I am not familiar with any regulations to that effect. Okay. Um, and partially, I think, related to what you originally brought up, which is that the prothon order is not um, threatened or endangered. So. Okay. It's, it's not even state level? I did not believe so. Okay. I, I mean, it, if, it must not be then. I thought it, I, I, well, we have to, have to keep in mind that this, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act was severely weakened this year by the administration. And so... Um, we have to keep our eyes out for the new legislation. It'll be new and improved legislation moving forward to do a better job protecting birds. Yeah. Okay. And then the pronunciation of that, that warbler. What's the story with that? In our practice run, Paige and Dana were giggling about it. And I was like, I thought she was making a joke. But then when they both pronounced it that way, I am clearly clueless. So they were named for the... And I'm sorry, I have forgotten what denomination of clerics, like medieval times clerics, um, because of their yellow robes. And so the, I, I think I think we're giggling about it because my whole life I called it prothonotary, but the actual Middle English pronunciation is actually prothonotary. Ah. So. Okay. Yep, that's exactly why I was giggling. <laughs> I, was, 
I have to think just, about it every time. <laughs> yeah, I was, I learned that today. So we're all learning stuff in our webinar. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, I, I think I that's learned all the something. questions and, oh, sorry, Ethan. Uh, you no worries. I'm just saying, I was saying I learn something every time and we, we actually do, do practice, practice runs. runs and every time we do practice runs, we also um, learn, much, learn mu so much from each other and then we build on it. It's, it's a fun thing. Definitely. Well, nobody has any more questions. I'm not seeing, oh, wait, we got to, ah, okay. I, this one we will type. Uh, I believe, Marsha, I believe you're talking about the, the Wobbler. Protho Notary. There you go. That should be in the glorious lemon yellow bird warbler um, of the of the bottomland forest. And I believe if you put that into all about birds, that species, the prothonotary warbler, it talks about that fact of how why it's named that way. Yeah, I've definitely read that somewhere too. <laughs> but I guess I didn't know the pronunciation of it. No. <laughs> a year ago, <laughs> that's why I'm still learning it. But, well, I just wanna say thanks to everyone who joined us on this webinar. I'm sorry that I froze at the beginning, but here I am now, I'm still alive. <laughs> um, and that we had a lot of fun putting it together. So I hope you had fun listening to it. <laughs> thanks everybody. See you next thanks. week. <laughs> All right. Actually, I won't be here, but. <laughs> next week, next webinar. Bye, everyone.